would like to welcome all of you back to session 21 of our study on spiritual gifts. And you are joining the people in our classroom as well as they joining you around the world. So thank you for being here. Over the past five sessions, we've begun to talk about each of the individual spiritual gifts. And we've talked about how those gifts are associated with different parts of the body. Now, this is not biblical. It's a categorization that allows us to remember and understand the functions of the spiritual gifts. We said that the gifts that are associated with the mind include administration, faith, knowledge, and wisdom. And then we moved at the very last session, the one just before this one, to the spiritual gift of discernment, which is seeing with your eyes almost like an x-ray into a person and being able to tell their motivations. Well, we're going to continue today with another spiritual gift that we associate with the eyes, and that would be leadership. Leadership would be those people whom God comes and empowers through the Holy Spirit to provide leadership towards reaching a goal. The leader can see something out in the distance that they believe is better than what they see right now, and they want to move forward towards accomplishing that goal. This past July 4th, the United States of America celebrated its 234th birthday. Now, to most of you watching this, 234 years is nothing. Your countries go back thousands of years. Our country is just a child compared to the long time that many of your nations have been in existence. But in our history, there have only been 44 presidents of the United States. That's not many. A president in the United States may run for office for four years and then they can run a second time for four years. Then they cannot run again. Otherwise, they might be elected and become a dictator. And that is against the democratic principles of the United States. Well, historians, they like to rank the presidents from the very best presidents to the very worst presidents of the United States. Whom do you think would be considered our very best president? Well, names like George Washington might come to mind, Abraham Lincoln certainly, and for some people they would say Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But those three names usually are in the top three because of the pivotal role that they played in our nation's history. But there is one name that is consistently in the top 10 that almost no one has ever heard of before. His name is James K. Polk. And most people, even in the United States, would say, I think he was a president, but I'm not sure when. I'm not sure when, uh, where. Huh, James K. Polk. Well, he was the 11th president of the United States, and he served just one four-year term in office. Not because he wasn't reelected. It was because when he campaigned to be president, he promised people he would only serve one term in office. That was unheard of at that time, and frankly, it's unheard of in this time, too. But he also promised the voters while he campaigned that while he was president and in just four years, he would accomplish three major goals. He would settle a dispute with Great Britain involving where the northern boundary of the United States was, especially related to Oregon. And then he would take the independent nation at that time called Texas, and he would make it part of the United States. And then third, he would make sure that Congress passed a bill and he would sign it into law that would lower the amount of taxes that were paid on trade with other countries. That was a very ambitious agenda in just four years. But he did it all. And then he left office. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. Not only that, he won a war with Mexico who was angry that we had taken Texas. He purchased from Mexico 
California, Arizona, and New Mexico. He opened up our Naval Academy where our sailors and officers in the United States Navy are trained. He started our nation's museum called the Smithsonian Institute. And he began construction of the Washington Monument, that very tall pillar that's in Washington, D.C. Not only that, he issued the first postage stamp in our nation's history. I would say James K. Polk accomplished quite a bit in the four years he was president. But perhaps the most important thing he accomplished was he kept his promises. He kept his word. And for politicians, that is very rare. In our country, in your country, in most countries, we are promised far more than what can be accomplished. And yet James K. Polk did it all. And the most important thing he did is he said he would serve one term and he left office after that. Do you know that he died of cholera three months after he left office? But in his life, he accomplished a great deal for our country. So why do historians rate this relatively unknown president in the top 10 with people of stellar reputations like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt? These are people who accomplished major things but so did James K. Polk. He did what leaders do. He tells people, this is what I see out in the future that we will accomplish. Then he puts together a program that brings people together and they accomplish what he set out to do. And then finally, and most importantly, leaders keep their word. True leaders keep their word. And James K. Polk was that kind of leader. And in many ways, I wish he was a better known president. But at least I got a chance to tell you about him. And I'm guessing you never heard of him before. So let's take a look today at this spiritual gift of leadership that's so important and that whom I think that James K. Polk epitomizes the natural leadership we want to look at spiritual leadership, where the Holy Spirit is the one accomplishing the work, not the person himself or herself. I would ask you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 12, one of the four main passages on spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. We have already taken an exhaustive look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so, we'll still come back to it, but for this gift, it's only mentioned in Romans chapter 8. So, let's begin down at verse 6, and we'll see where it's mentioned and in what context. Paul writes, We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to the, his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. And if it's teaching, let him teach. And then we come to verse 8. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. And if it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So it's in a whole group of important spiritual gifts. It's not listed as the first one, which would somehow emphasize that it has an important role, its important role in impacting others. It's just another gift listed. But he also encourages those with the gift to govern with all diligence, to stick at it, to do the job, to be James K. Polk, to do what you say, say what you do, and accomplish what you set out to do working with everyone else. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, there is a passage a little later on that helps to give the other side of leadership. You see, 
An effective leader can't lead alone. An effective leader needs people who are good followers. As much as there's the part of good leadership, there's the neglected study of good followership, being a good follower of a good leader. And for that, let's turn to Hebrews, towards the back of the Bible. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 13, the very last chapter in Hebrews, right before the book of James. And while you're turning in your Bible to this, I'll remind you, those of you who are watching by DVD, please open your Bible, study along with us. Uh, this is a course, you are a student, and we would want you to take part in looking at the verses, as well as those in the classroom. So in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 17, Paul gives some advice to those of us who do not have the gift of leadership. And he says in verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. These are very important guidelines for those of us who are followers. We're to obey our leaders. We're to give them honor and respect. We're supposed to remember that they are going to one day be held accountable for the decisions that they have made, the actions that they have taken, the programs they had, have uh, implemented. And if we obey them, then being a leader is a joy. It's not a burden. And not only that, if we obey our leaders and we're good followers, it also works out well for us. But what happens all too often in leadership? Everybody says they know how to do it better. This is the wrong thing. If I was the leader, we would do this. And oh, can you believe the leader wants us to take that action? We grumble and we mumble. We are like the children of Israel following Moses and all the time grumbling and saying, you know, this is so hard. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? At least there, you know, we had meat to eat. Come on. Well, being a leader is all about bringing change. And let's face it, nobody likes change. Everybody likes it the way that it is. And so when a leader comes and says, I have a new idea, everybody automatically is going, oh no, here we go again. And they're reluctant to move forward. Being a good follower is obeying your leaders, trusting that the leader is leading us in a good direction, that the leader has been uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to present a plan that is good for the church and good for God's people. So I have to admit, I've been guilty of this same thing from time to time. I have thought that the leaders of my church have made mistakes, but I'm often reminded that they're doing the best they can and they're going to one day stand before Jesus and have to explain their actions. And so I try my best to obey the leaders, follow their uh, direction, and what I've appreciated about my leaders at my church is there are times they have made mistakes. There are times where I remember saying, I don't think that's a good idea, but okay. And then it didn't turn out well. And here's what those leaders do. They stand before the body and they say, I'm sorry. I made the wrong decision. We headed in the wrong direction. And now we're going to make sure that we head in a better direction. Now you might think when a leader says that, they lose the respect of the people in the congregation. Far from it. The people in the congregation go, that person is real. That person is authentic. If that person is willing to admit when they're wrong, then I'm gonna trust them that if they say we're gonna head in this direction, even if they're wrong, I know that one day they'll admit it and we'll head in another direction. That's a leader. That's when leadership is more about character 
than it is about competence. And I admire leaders who do that, and sometimes too few leaders do that, both in the political world, certainly, and in the church as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Greek word for leadership and for leaders. The Greek word has to do with, that has to do with leadership is proisteme, proisteme. And those of you following along in Strong's Concordance, you will find that that is G4291. And it is a word that has some rich meaning because literally it means to stand before the people. That's what leaders do. Leaders aren't in the back going, all right, you guys, go ahead. I'm right back here. I'm at headquarters. I'll let you know how things are going. No, leaders are right up front in the line. They're the ones who are taking the risks. They're the ones who are in danger, but they're saying, come on, follow me. We're going this way. Those are the leaders you want to follow, not the ones who send you forward and then they stay in the back and they don't do an awful lot of the work. It also, in the Greek, has the meaning of just simply to lead, to preside over, to direct. It also contains the idea of being a protector, of being a guardian. And think of this in terms of being a father and a mother. When your children are small, they really need protection. They need your guidance. They need your guardianship. They are without the knowledge and experience that we have as adults. This is a little bit of what Paul is saying about the role of leaders in the church. They are the protectors of the people. They are the guardians of the church. And as so, we should treat them with respect. The definition that we're going to use is no better than the literal meaning of the term. That our definition is simply going to be to stand before. To stand before. That's what a leader does. What's the purpose of leadership? It's to cast vision. A vision is a picture in the person's mind. Here's what the future is going to look like. And as people hear about that vision, they come alongside, they're excited about it, and they volunteer to help out, and they want to move forward and accomplish it. And a leader has a chance to uh, cast that vision and watch as people are drawn like a magnet to whatever the picture is, and then they work alongside the people to make sure it's accomplished. What's the role of the church? Well, it depends on where the church is in its uh, stage of existence. If it's a new church, then the role is founding the church. And it's very difficult to found a new church. You have to start everything. But most of the time, you lead an existing church, and then it is managing the church. What gifts are usually in a leader's mix? What cluster of gifts come around leadership? Well, typically discernment or faith, knowledge, wisdom. Often with leaders, it's combined with teaching. And often, shepherding is a leadership. We call the pastor sometimes a pastor shepherd. We also call him pastor teacher. It depends on how God has created them and equipped them for their role. Now, looking at the commentators, I went back to Matthew Henry, a long time, many centuries person that people respect for his commentaries. And this is not an exact quote. I have changed certain words to make it more modern so we can understand some archaic language. But he says, in essence, the word leadership denotes both care and hard work to discover what is wrong, to reduce the number of people who have gone astray, to rebuke and warn those who have fallen, and to keep the church pure. It's interesting that Matthew Henry focuses on the negative, not the positive of leadership. He says, find out what's wrong, negative. Reduce the number of people who are leaving, negative. 
rebuke and warn those who have fallen, negative, and keep the church pure, positive. So he sees the role of making sure you don't do these things instead of you do these other things. And there is that component to leadership. But I believe leadership is much more positive than negative. I think you want to catch people doing things right and affirm them, not look for them doing things wrong and criticize them. Another commentator, Carl Westerlin, says, leading is the ability to be a pace setter. And that's for the group and for individuals. And he puts his emphasis on the positive and talks about to lead with all diligence. That it's the leader who has a responsibility to work hard and to get things done. The best definition that I have ever heard on leadership comes from someone who is not a Christian someone who comes from the field of education. And it may be because as a former educator, I resonate with the words that he says. It is simple, it is short, and I think it captures the essence of leadership, both in the world and in the church. The difference being, in the church, it's the spirit working through the person. The man's name is Roland Barth, and he's an educational theorist and philosopher well known in the educational field. And he says, listen to this, leadership is making happen what you believe in. Leadership is making happen what you believe in. So first, Roland Barth is saying, you have a certain set of core beliefs and those form the foundation for everything else you do, and then you make it happen. To me, that is what leaders do. They have a rock-solid set of beliefs that then form the vision that they have, and those guiding beliefs then are the things leaders make happen. It's a wonderful definition. We've talked in the past about uh, visual aids, and we said visual aids gives us a picture in our mind that helps us to understand what the particular spiritual gift is. Now all of us have ridden in a car and when we're in the car in the daytime there's no problem. You can see out in the future. But what happens at night? You have to turn on the headlights. If you don't turn on the headlights you're going to run into something. You're going to have an accident. Well when leaders lead and they're leading for change. They're not leading in daylight. No one's ever gone there before. They're leading in the dark. They need to turn on the headlights of leadership to be able to have people see a picture of what's out in the future. And then people feel more confident that whatever's being proposed is something good for the church. So the visual aid I'd like you to have in your mind, a car, it's dark in the future and the lights come on and you see just a glimpse of what lies ahead. Just as headlights show the way ahead, so the Holy Spirit empowers leaders to help people see what lies just down the road. The Holy Spirit gives a vision, a mental picture of what might be, of what could be, of what should be something that's better than what people are currently experiencing. Moses is a great example. The people of Israel, they'd never been to the promised land. Well, neither had Moses. But Moses knew God had called him to lead the people to the promised land. And so, despite their grumbling and mumbling, he continued on and he persevered and he led with all diligence until eventually they came to the promised land and then he blew it. He got angry and he was mad at God because all the people of Israel had kept giving him a hard time because leadership is hard. It is among the hardest things you could ever do in life. And so God 
told him that to answer the people's complaint about water, he should speak to that rock and water would flow out. And Moses was mad and he hit the rock. And God said, I told you to speak to the rock, not hit it. And as a result, you will not be able to go into the promised land. Instead, the people will, and they did under Joshua's leadership. Moses was allowed graciously by God to go up into the mountains and be able to look out and see the promised land, but he never stood, stepped foot into it. So leadership has its uh, times where you are also going to experience some discipline from God if you don't lead the way God tells you. Well, in the Bible, in Acts 15, and if you would turn to that, Acts chapter 15, we see a situation where leadership's in action. It's the very first time that the church has faced a major crisis. There are some former Pharisees who have become Christians, but they're still kind of locked into this mindset that you have to follow certain rules. And so as a result, uh, they have been preaching that it's okay if the Gentiles become Christians, but they have to, they needed to be uh, circumcised. They needed to be given the sign that all Jewish people had that denoted that they were in fact uh, Jews. And so they come to this great council of Jerusalem and the people who are arguing that you must be circumcised, they come and they present their point of view. And the council listens and they also listen to Paul and Barnabas because they're saying you don't have to do this, that God doesn't require it of Gentiles. And they report on the wonderful things that God has been doing as they have traveled on their missionary journeys. And so both sides present their case. So if we go down to verse 13, we see the culmination of this and we see leadership arise. So when the arguments had been prepared and when Peter and Barnabas and Paul and everyone had had their say, James spoke up, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described for us how God had first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. So even in the Old Testament, God was giving some hints that Gentiles would become part of uh, the Jewish faith at that time and then part of the church. Now James, who by the way is the brother of Jesus, although his father was not God, his father was Joseph, but he is his brother and he says, it's my judgment therefore we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sunday. And then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men, send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So they chose Judas, called Barsabas, and Silas, two men who were leaders among them, and they sent them with the following letter. And the letter echoes what James said. So the people in Jerusalem looked to James, they heard his argument, and they said, that's a leader. I think that's what we should do. And they followed his direction for the future. Now I have a brief example of a personal experience with leadership. I once went down with some people from my church to the west side of Chicago where many Hispanics, where many Latinos live. And there was a group of people that were meeting in a home. They wanted to start a church and they had 
bought a building and they were getting ready to turn that building into a church and then invite their friends and neighbors to come. And the man who was their pastor stood up and he said, thank you for coming. I just want you for a second to imagine. Imagine that over there, the people are coming through the doors. And imagine that over there, we're installing pews, seats for the people to come, be seated and hear the word of God. And look, there's the pastor standing up and preaching to the people. And over there, there's the choir and they're singing beautiful music. And all we lack is the money to make it happen. Well, I'm going, where's my checkbook? I'm going to sign up right now. He made it seem so real that I wanted to help out. That's leadership. Do you see, he said, imagine, look, that's what leaders do. Well, I have some questions for you, and I'd like you to answer these questions personally. And if you answer yes to one or more of them, you may very well have the gift of leadership. Has God worked through you to, one, inspire believers to work together voluntarily and willingly? Number two, have you had the opportunity to assign people to various work tasks and do so based on what they do best? And number three, has God given you the opportunity to tell people about an idea for how the church could be improved? People agree and they go ahead and accomplish it. If you can say yes to one of those, you may very well have the gift of leadership. Well, I hope you'll join us next time as we move and study another of the spiritual gifts, this one on prophecy.